Well, uh, good, good evening, everybody. Um, apologies for the shirt. This is a bad dad shirt for my daughters. Every year they get me one of these. It's uh, a bit garish, a bit bright, a bit loud. Uh, never mind. It's uh, it's very, very comfortable. So that's the main thing. Um, so this video by the dude, the, the dude, sorry, the, the dude, where did I get that from? Uh, by the dude is uh, to do with um, one of, probably one of the most interesting characters from um, the whole of the Making a Murder series, Len Kaczynski. Um, it's difficult to know what to make of Len. Um, to me, he seems to fit two bills quite, quite nicely. He's, on, on the one hand, he's the um, very much, um, has got a conflict of interest in that he's um, actively working for the state, but the system allows him to, to say that, no, he's not working for the state, he's working for his client in order to get the best deal, the best plea deal. Um, it, it's just a bizarre situation, isn't it? Um, one wonders what to, what to make of, of a system that allows your, your defense attorney to be so um, against you and in favor of the, of the state. It, it really does beg a belief at times. Um, anyway, let's just crack on. Um, let us know what, what your thoughts are on Len Kaczynski. Um, the, the, the one thing I would say is, from my point of view, I, I give him credit for the fact that he's appeared in both series one and series two. Um, he's prepared to, 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 to sort of present his, his argument, if you like, his, his uh, raison d'etre. Um, I, I, th I think, yeah, th th there's definitely something wrong with the character, with, the, with the Len. Um, I don't think the dude is very fond of Len at all. Uh, just sees him as, as a little weasel, which is which is fair enough, I suppose. Um, anyway, let's click on that. Let's click on that. Hopefully that's us sharing screen and sound. Let me move me to the top. Let's click on play. This this isn't very long, about 15 minutes. Um, so making a murder, Len Kaczynski, the fool, <laughs> and talk about conspiracy. So let's uh, let's sit back and enjoy another of the dude's fine videos. Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murder on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer I go over the evidence the documents the photos so if you'd like stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see hello everybody how you doing today I wanted to do do a video today and talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the things that have been happening recently with with Brendan's case in particular seeing as the oral arguments are coming up here on the 26th of September um, you know recently Good old Lynn Kaczynski decided to, to, you know, throw in his two cents. Well, he had a lot of unflattering things to say about supporters of Brendan and Stephen. And, you know, really kind of uh, his opinion of, of them is, is poor. And I believe that his information regarding some of the strongest supporters is off. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, anyways, I'll leave the link to the article that that was done with him where he, you know, went ahead and answered some questions. Um, but I will give him credit for one thing. I'll give him credit because he did say he hopes that the Seventh Circuit Court does make, you know, effective law to help protect juveniles. So, at least on that, I can say, okay, good boy. Good boy, Lenny. Uh, you may have been, you know, Len Kaczynski, in my opinion, because you were way too k chintzy with uh, Brennan's defense but hey at least you're at least you understand the way the wind is blowing now and you realize that this is not acceptable to do this with juveniles especially in as suggestible and impressionable ones like Brendan so and and nobody's ever gonna forget what you and O'Kelly did so but getting beyond that anyways I'll leave the article I'll leave the link I mean if you uh, let me put it another way Lynn 
if you think that we're all just swayed by a documentary, as you said in the article, and that we're we're just mob mentality, step into some of our groups. Come in with your come in with your version of the, of events, and we're gonna throw all kinds of you know evidence at you. We're gonna actually you're gonna actually see us throwing transcripts and case documents at you to back up what we're saying. We're not gonna be posting a documentary, just so you know. So. Anyways, so that's basically what I had to say to Lynn. He's uh, he's a bit confused, but at least he's on board with the fact that juveniles do need help. So, and he hopes that the Seventh Circuit Court gets that all, you know, dialed in and right. So, the other thing I wanted to talk about, that's something that's just kind of odd. I hear, I hear this kind of occasionally, you know, and, and it's fine. I understand certain people have their own point of view, but... I was recently watching uh, Jim Haggerty, I believe is his name, or something like that, watching his video recently. It was about Brendan, and he basically is, you know, did this video where he talks with a defense lawyer, somebody who understands the whole process and, and, and how these types of cases work and stuff like that. And they're going over basically all the, the, the technical reasons of why Brendan, you know, basically deserves to be released and why they hope he will be released. But here's the thing that he was saying that kind of just made me just want to do this video. He says in the video, he says, oh, no, 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 no. I don't believe that there's like some kind of widespread, you know, kind of, you know, corruption or something like that. You know, like he's basically saying he doesn't believe that that there's like some people there that kind of conspired to make this kind of happen. Well, or at least he says he doesn't think it's widespread. Now, I don't know exactly what he means by that, but... Here's the way I feel about it. Number one, you can you can never ever in this situation rule out conspiracy because you've already seen it once. You've already seen it once from this area. In 1985, they you saw how everything clicked up and clicked and linked and click 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 so that they could get the conviction against Stephen for something he didn't do. Now, some people are gonna say, "Oh yeah, well they didn't know." Yes, they knew. They knew. They knew that it was Gregory Allen, and they did it anyway. Okay, when you have that kind of willful... There's a pattern to genius. There's a method behind the magic. I always tell people my inspiration... Ignorance to the law or, you know, failure to follow the law or the, or the standard operating procedure that, you know, officers are supposed to follow for a reason and you have these officers lying in court and you know then you have the lead prosecutor Vogel who actually had a folder with Gregory Allen's you know paperwork and info in the box with all of the Stephen Avery info for the trial when he was prosecuting Stephen Avery the Gregory Allen file was in there yeah so and then you add on top of that that after all this, where all this obvious, obvious corruption, and the attorney general at the time, Peg Lautenschlager, signs, signs off and says that it was communication problem. No. Give me a break. You gotta be kidding me. A communication problem. If it was such a communication problem, how does Vogel end up with Gregor, a, a folder with Gregory Allen in Stephen Avery's file? That tells me right there that he was aware of what was going on. And that's that's not the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department, okay? That's not that's not NCSD. You've now moved up the ladder to the prosecutor's office. He was corrupt. And then you have Peg Lautenschlager signing off, the, all the way up to the, the Wisconsin AG, signing off that it was a communication issue problem. And I've already told you why I don't believe it was a communication issue, because they communicated to Colburn that they thought it was Gregory Allen from Brown County Police Department. Colburn got that message he remembered that message and eight years later when Stephen got released from prison he suddenly decided he needed to write a report about it so doesn't sound like communication was the issue so when you add up all these things and sound and look at how the ridiculous they are and how high, high up the ladder basically that this went where you got Peg Lautenschlager you know signing off to cover everybody's butt saying it was a communication issue Okay, that's not just in Manitowoc anymore. 
that shows that that area has a, a you know they're just wired to 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 do that you know and you know my theory of what happens here with with Teresa Hallback really in terms of the corruption is I think maybe Jim might be somewhat right I don't believe everybody knew what was going on I really don't I believe that there was a few key individuals mainly Manitowoc County Sheriff's officers who were basically putting things you know putting things where they get found and therefore there is this evidence to use against Stephen Avery I think maybe some of the other officers for instance the Calumet officers may have suspected that there was something fishy going on but I guarantee you none of them wanted to rock the boat everybody just basically was like you know what no you know there's also this evidence and that evidence they basically reasoned in their own minds that no this is the right guy and they convinced themselves that it was Stephen and Stephen was the right guy even though they probably suspected that there was something going on with this with this evidence that wasn't quite right that's what I think so I don't think necessarily that everybody was all in on it and to give you a perfect example of why I don't you know I the the way I think it was for a lot of officers in this situation is look at Kacharski look at Kacharski when he's testifying that boy was just served up to the lions man he had no idea what he was getting into and when they're asking him in court he doesn't know how to answer but he wants to protect his brothers he's 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 all about wanting to protect his brothers but the problem is he doesn't he doesn't realize he didn't realize you know he just there were certain things about that situation he didn't realize and there was just he ends up looking foolish on the stand because he really didn't understand at the time why he was there and the fact that he was supposed to be watching those you know Manitowoc County officers so that's kind of my point that Kucharski definitely wasn't in the know he definitely was one of the ones that did not know what was going on and I'm sure there was a lot I'm sure there was a lot of officers that didn't really know what was going on but I think maybe there might have been officers that thought there might have been some fishy aspects to it, but they were just like not inclined to start asking questions and making waves. And so this whole thing just goes and, and, and that's the way it is. And then Brendan, they, then there's Brendan's confession. Everybody takes a big sigh of relief, a uh, big, you know, sigh of relief. Like, okay, good. It was Steven. Not, you know, not taking into account that that confession is ridiculous beyond ridiculous. You know, I mean, just they they completely feed him that that confession pretty much from start to finish. They feed him all the plot points. They feed him any pertinent information and, and, and get him to regurgitate it back to them so that they can use it in court against him and stuff like that. So he, it's obvious that that. So, you know, what I mean, what I'm getting at is, is that a lot of law enforcement basically were just willing to go along with it and didn't want to ask questions. Not that it was necessarily a huge conspiracy, but I think there were a handful of people who actually were active, you know, active parts, you know, active members, active players, as it were, in this little conspiracy. So when it comes down to it, I just really don't see how anybody could really rule out corruption. Now, I I can I can definitely agree with you know, people that want to say it was a small net, if it was a, you know, there was only a handful of people that were really in the know, uh, the rest of the officers were basically just finding the evidence as it lay and moving, moving forward without questioning really where it might have came from. So I think that's really what ha may have happened here. I, I have trouble believing that every single officer and every single entity involved in this was all in the know and were all in on it. I also have trouble agreeing with that. But I don't, I, I find it very, very easy to believe that a small group of individuals tried to influence this whole thing and, and, the, and did it in a clever way so that it was found by other people who hadn't put it there and made it look more legitimate when it's found. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of this evidence still looks illegitimate. It still has issues. The key, the way it's found, the fact that it only has Stephen's DNA on it, really strange. The bones, only 60% 60, only 60 of them are found. And then we got this femur that has the same calcination that's found over in the Redent burn pile, has the same calcination as the other bones found in Stephen's burn pit and in Barb's burn peril, but it's not the same. 
It's not from the. It's not from Teresa. It's like okay, but it has the same calcination. I mean, it's you gotta can't help but wonder there, but you know what's going on there. I mean, it's just like it, it would make more sense according to the experts in this. You know, who have testified and all that stuff, that these bones moved to the burn pit, not the other way around, and because there was a, a, an expert there that had experience with bones that had been moved after being burned. So, he was able to offer his expert opinion on that. The fact is, is that why would there be bones in the burn barrel in the first place? Why would there be bones in two separate spots? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. It makes more sense that that somebody was trying to put these there and use that burn barrel to transport them. That's really what makes more sense to me. So, because there, there, there is no... The other part of it is, is that there's no report of a foul-smelling fire. And when you burn somebody, a person, on a fire like that, it creates a stench. It creates a smell that is very distinctive. And you can't escape it. It's very distinctive. You would not be able to forget about it. That never happened. In fact... I have another video where I talk about the, the place where there was a foul-smelling fire, which is up on Xander Road, which is about four and a half miles north of Avery Salvage. Anyways, if you want to go ahead, I'll leave that link to that video down below. I'll also leave the link to Jim Hogarty's video down below. But I basically wanted to kind of get the conversation here going and maybe get some people talking about the fact of how much do you believe, how much do you believe the, the corruption may be, you know, how, how deep do you think it is there? Do you think it's a small group? Do you think it's the whole the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle? They're all they're all in on it and are all they're all you know guilty of conspiracy. I don't know. I'm just curious to hear everybody else's thoughts on that. And uh, that's about it for today's video. I want to encourage everybody to use the hashtag Free Brendan Dassey if you're on Twitter and stuff like that. We're trying to get that trending so that hopefully it's going to be you know trending high on the day that you know the orals come around on the 26th of this month. So, if you're on Twitter and stuff like that, please do that. And uh, that's about it for today. And uh, we'll see you. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. <coughs> well, once again, uh, great stuff by, by the dude. Uh, some really interesting questions there. Um, <laughs> you know, it's getting back to Len Kaczynski. Um, even William Duffin, Judge Duffin, um, didn't um, agree that he was um, guilty of ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, I suspect that was because of some sort of standard. Um, there's two different ineffective assistance of counsel standards that apparently you can go for. One is some like Gulliver and the other one is Strickland. Uh, I, I can never remember. I'm sure somebody out there can uh, can fill us in on the the exact details. But yeah, getting back to Kucharski, um, the dude mentions him. Um, a certain sympathy for him. He, uh, you know, even if he knew things were dodgy, what's he going to do? He, he, you know, as, as I've said so many times, you know, if you're in rural. Manitowoc or Calumet County, you can't call the A-team. Um, you, you, you can just do the job to the best of your ability uh, and realise that, you know, you've got to uh, be subordinate to the ones that are given orders. Um, anyway, I um, thought, thought the dude mentioned some, some really interesting questions there. Um, you know, obviously the conspiracy, yeah. It's, I think it's pretty obvious. There's only certain people that, that know of the conspiracy. How deep does it go? Um, I think that's the sort of question that Fleetside would uh, would love to answer. Um, I think it's quite clear. It goes way, way, way up the food chain. Um, anyway, um, hope you enjoyed that one. I, I, I certainly did. Um, just just awesome videos and, and great to hear the dude isn't it you know um you know stuff stuff that he says three four years later 
still relevant today. Um, anyway, catch you all soon. Um, I'm going to go and change this shirt because it's far too loud. Catch you soon. Bye for now.